My name is Paul Brigner. I'm the Director of Technology Policy for the Chamber. And uh, I work closely with the Smart Contracts Alliance. And this meeting, as Perry Ann has already described, is about smart contracts auditing and testing and some challenges with implementations, uh, implement, implementation around smart contracts. So uh, we have, just to give you an overview of the format for this meeting today, we have a few featured presentations. And I think to set this up, it's great to have an example of a smart contract application, a very complicated one that uh, we'll see in action. We'll see a, a live version of that by OTCXN. Um, here we have Rosario Ingargoya. Is that correct? Close enough. Okay, close enough. You have to correct me on that. So he's going to kick it off um, with that presentation, and then we'll have three more. Then we're going to have a roundtable discussion. And as it happens with the chamber, often our our events are often oversold and they're a little too big, bigger than we expected. So we wanted to have a roundtable. This is the best we can do. So the, <laughs> to, to simulate that, we have a few experts here who we've pulled out from our membership who we are, they're prepared to answer your questions and contribute to the discussion. Um, so we encourage you all on that second part of this meeting to ask a lot of questions. These individuals are gonna help answer them and uh, we should have a very great opportunity to learn and discuss this topic. So without further ado, Rosario. All right, so as mentioned, my name is Rosario Ingarjola. I'm the um, CEO and founder of a company called OTCXN. Uh, we're based here in San Francisco, not far from here, um, about 50 people. Uh, we consider ourselves uh, to basically be a capital markets trading infrastructure and blockchain technology company. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about a very specific use case um, in, in smart contracts, but first a little bit just to kind of level set what, what it is that we're achieving as a firm. Um, we have a very specific core value proposition and that's the elimination of trading counterparty and settlement risk uh, in financial markets. And so we are starting off in, in the crypto space and the spot foreign exchange space, but it's a very broad uh, digital asset play and the technology that we've been building with our 40 some odd engineers over the last three years uh, is, is really kind of comprised of four major parts. Um, there's an asset tokenization component to that. Uh, there's a proprietary blockchain layer uh, that we've built from, from the ground up, which is a very um, unique multi-ledger uh, purpose-built solution. Um, we have a real-time collateral management uh, part of our stack, and then we have all of the different uh, services that support the whole trade to settlement life cycle. So four different trading platforms that sit on top of that common infrastructure. Uh, and a little bit about the way the, the network operates. So this is, um, there's two main actors, there's trading entities uh, and there's custodians. This is all institutional by the way, none of this is, none of this is retail. We have a solution that we give to custodial entities that lets them with a few mouse clicks, create a blockchain ledger for any asset that they want to support the tokenization of on the network. Um, they're also then able to see incoming client requests, clients that hold assets at those custodians, both whether whatever the asset is, could be fiat, could be crypto, uh, make requests to add those assets or digitize those assets onto those asset ledgers so that they are available uh, on the network. Once a client has assets that have been digitized onto the network, they're freely tradable with anybody else that's on network without any trading counterparty and settlement risk and where those trades are essentially instantaneous in terms of clearing and settlement uh, and with finality. Um, I guess the thing that I'm gonna turn over to my colleague Amal Sharma, who is our director of token engineering, who's gonna take us through uh, what is really a prototype right now for um, solving for there's you probably have noticed there's kind of a dearth of custodians in the particularly in the digital asset space in the crypto space. So one of the thoughts that we had was how do we take what we've achieved with uh, brick and mortar custodians that can custody digital assets and, and fiat and other assets? How do we create a smart contract, a virtual custodian, a way where somebody could bring a wallet directly to the network and transact with other people on the network, including for fiat and other assets, uh, without counterparty and settlement risk where you still have an atomic exchange of those assets. So I'm gonna let them all uh, take us through that. Thank you, Rosario. So as Rosario explained very well about how the OTCXN platform works, this diagram will help me do the demo about how the OTCXN platform works internally. 
So let's take an example. We have a trader one and trader two, and trader one is associated with the custodian one, and trader two is associated with custodian two. So trader one sends the collateral to the custodian one, and then the trader one two sends the collateral to custodian two. After the collateral is received by the custodian one and custodian two, then the collateral is tokenized into the OTCXN platform. After that, the trader one and trader two are then enabled to do the transaction. After the transaction is complete, which is number three, then the custodian one and custodian two then do the offline settlement. So this is how basically the current OTC Accessing platform works. Now when we started looking into the smart contract, we wanted to solve two major problems. One was how can we replace a traditional custodian with a smart contract custodian? Second problem was how can we do an instant settlement, especially in the crypto versus fiat, which is kind of the holy grail of the uh, settlement right now. So in this example, in this flowchart, if you see, we do not have a custodian two. We have replaced the custodian two with the virtual custodian smart contract. So the, like previous example, the trader one sends the collateral to the custodian, and the trader two sends the ether to the virtual custodian smart contract. Here we have one more element, which is a wire account. The wire account is a San Francisco-based company, which has a fiat-based wallet and they expose their APIs. We use the wire for the fiat settlement. So like before, the trader two sends the ethers to the virtual custodian smart contract, and then that is uh, tokenized into the OTC Excel platform. After that, number five, the same way trader one and trader two do the fiat versus crypto trade. And during the settlement, the virtual custodian smart contract sends the fund from the uh, smart contract into the atomic swap smart contract, and finally into the Trader 1's Ethereum wallet. That is the settlement for the Ethereum part. And for the uh, Fiat part, the Fiat moves from the custodian's wire account into the Trader 2's wire account. And that finishes the whole crypto versus Fiat settlement. To explain you better, um, I should will show you guys a small demo. So this is the trader window that we have at the OTCXN. If I am the trader two, in the previous example, I am uh, depositing the ether into the smart contract. I come into this and I have a widget, I launch a smart contract and I have this address. So I go to the MetaMask account and send the ethers to my smart contract. The moment the ethers are received in this, then the balances show up here in this widget. Also we have a wallet, ether wallet and the wire wallet Widget, if you want to do a settlement instantly, as I mentioned before, you come, enter your uh, Ether wallet account address or the wire wallet account address, and the settlement will come into your account immediately after the trade. So now, um, as a trader one, I'm going to do a trade. I'm going to buy an Ether. Amount three, create one. I have the USD. I'm associated with the custodian one. And my counterpart is trader two. Now I go back to the trader two's window. I see a great trade coming to my way. I accept that. So what is happening behind the scene is the trade first finishes into our own proprietary blockchain. And then for settlement, the funds are moving from the virtual custodian smart contract into the atomic swap smart contract. And then the wire uh, money is being moved from the custodian's account into the wire wallet of the uh, trader. Right now we are waiting for the final, um, final movement of the funds into the Ether wallet. And this takes time on the Ethereum network. Um, I'm, in the subsequent slides, I'm going to talk about one of the issues with the smart contracts, the sort of transactions. In the meantime, I can go to my wire account and see if I have received the fiat. It 
state is, I received the fiat, right? So the one part of the settlement. I What's the typical settlement time, do you find? Settlement time is uh, for the whole trade or just one? For team, full trade is about uh, one minute. We should be able to do that. So that finishes the trade. And I have the links here of my public ledger account. So I can click on this and it opens up the Ethereum transaction. You see the funds move from the, the atomic swap contract into the Ether wallet. So that's the second part of the transaction. So you have seen the demo, right? I'm basically personally a big fan of the smart contract. I see the huge future there. But doing working on this from last few months, we have seen some challenges. Um, behind the scenes, lots of things were going on. Um, and we expect the smart contract to behave as an independent unit, handling everything. For example, talking to Wire, talking to our proprietary blockchain, and doing a lot of calculations there. But the complexity limitations is there in the smart contract. So that is one thing we found that we need, the smart contract needs a separate module to work with, to interact with, with this separate module, can listen to these other events. And that is the limitation that we found, the first one. The other limitation that we found on technical level is the lack of Oracle functionality. In smart contract world, the Oracle is something where the smart contract makes an external call and gets information and reacts based on that. Now that external call has to be something which has to be permanent. For example, if I'm making a call based on the weather information, and the smart contract runs into different, different machines, and if these different machines are in a decentralized way um, competing to complete the transaction. Now, each machine will get a different weather information and will process the information differently. So it is not a finality, in a way. In our example, we did a wire transaction. If imagine if that wire transaction is part of the smart contract, then the multiple <laughs> wire transactions of the fiat will happen by different, different machines, and we don't want to do that. The other problem is the deployment of the smart contract and the fourth point, which is the transactions. You have seen it is slow, um, at least in the Ethereum world, where the 95% of the dApps and the smart contracts are being built. Now, the Ethereum Foundation is working to increase the, the transaction speed and then number of transactions it can handle per second. Uh, they're handling with the plasma, the sharding. It's like in a few years it will come. But that is now a problem. The other thing is about the Number five, which is the Ethereum heavy node. As part of the decentralized world, we wanted to host our own Ethereum node. But the problem of hosting the own Ethereum node is that it takes about 40 hours to sync our node with the other nodes. And then also some of the big companies who are on production, their node becomes out of the sync. Now, um, that becomes a big problem when you have something running on the trade level and your node becomes out of the sync. One of the workaround is a good company called Amphira. They give you an API, they host a one mega node, and um, you, that is much more reliable. All big companies like MetaMask, Xerox are using the Infura to make a call to the uh, Ethereum network. The next problem, which is the sixth one, is the event filtering. So when we deploy our smart contract, we listen to the events, like what files were transferred to it. Even though even uh, I used the example of the Ether in my trade, we also accept all the ERC20 tokens in the, into our smart contract. But to listen to the events of the ERC20 smart contract, we have to listen to the smart contract directly. Now that problem is because there are so many events happening on that particular ERC20 smart contract, let's say that person A is sending the money to person B, I have to listen to that also, even though that is not related to my transaction. Um, so that is, I think is a smaller problem, probably should be solved very soon. This next problem is about the replacement. By the design of initial smart contract, when it is deployed on the Ethereum network, it cannot be changed. Uh, now there are some workarounds like the proxy pattern by the open Zeppelin, but imagine if you have a found a bug in the smart contract, how will you replace that? Yeah, and so much of money are residing on that smart contract then. So proxy pattern is kind of a hack, but I think it is working now, industry is adopting that, but we need a better solution for that. So those were all the uh, technical challenges, there are some of the non-technical challenges also. For example, the Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the uh, biggest cryptocurrency in the market right now, but by the design, there is no support for the 
smart contract in the Bitcoin. <laughs> One of the workaround is the rootstock. Now the rootstock um, has a side chain, which is the main uh, chain of the Bitcoin. And um, there is a two-way peg between the side chain of the Bitcoin and the mainnet. So it's a workaround, but we need a smart contract for the native Bitcoin itself, which is not there. The other problem is the hacks and the expensive audits. We, of course, all know about the DAO hack that happened, which is like 50 to $60 million. And then recently, about um, three weeks ago, there was a spank chain hack, which was thankfully only $40,000. Now, if any developer has to actually launch into production, they have to get their smart contract audited. Now, audition, well, the auditing of the smart contract is about forty dollars to $50,000 on an average, which is still expensive from the smart from the startup's perspective. Uh, so I think that is a big problem where I feel there will be a situation maybe where be, there will be a black swan vulnerability that actually impacts all the smart contract. And as more and more people are, and more and more companies are actually adopting this, is there will be a situation probably where suddenly everyone is rushing to fix their smart contract. Next thing is the real world negotiations and the contracts. In the real world, we all do basically some negotiation when we sign a contract. After the, the signing of contracts also, or some amendments also happen into that. But imagine if I have launched a smart contract and now I cannot change anything. Or I've, if I have taken a loan from a bank and then I do a late payment, then at least I can talk to the, to the bank that, okay, I can sign a new contract. But these kind of things cannot happen in the smart contract right now. Number four is the need for the gas. So every transaction that you have seen so far needs an extra money for the transaction to complete. And that has to be accounted into the trade also. The number fifth, which is actually uh, very important, is the decentralized exchanges and the dApps. There are around 1,900 dApps in the market. And then all these decentralized exchanges are, in a way, dependent on the smart contracts. And their new interlink of the smart contracts and the new pattern are coming into the market. And that means new vulnerabilities. Uh, about a few months ago, a very good company, ZeroX, there was a main vulnerability that was found by consensus where there was some signature um, hack that could happen. So as a developer, you have to always keep up with what is going to happen in terms of, in terms of the vulnerability link. Number six, which is the data privacy. When you have something on the, at least in the Ethereum uh, smart contract, it is not private. So you cannot have something, uh, private information as part of the smart contract itself. Number seven, and something which I care about a lot, which is the security tokens. As per the SEC, all the ICOs that are happening, in a way, are the security token offering. What that means is that now, uh, also there is also the uh, security token uh, disruption happening in terms of the real estate, because about $200 trillion of the real estate might be impacted with this security token offering. Now, all of that will be existing on the smart contract. Um, so. Security token needs some of the compliance requirement, like KYC ML, the accreditation check, then also the trunches uh, in, that we have seen recently. So, but the smart contracts are not built to handle those kind of complexity. And there are some of the companies who are working uh, with some kind of hacks like on-chain, off-chain data, but then smart contract lacks those kind of basic functionality. So I've mentioned about 14 negatives about the smart contract so far, uh, but I'm still a big fan. So what we have right now is like a centralized ex systems, um, which are almost like a telephone exchanges, uh, simple telephone lines. But the smart contracts are like the, tele the mobile phones of 90s. At that time, they were looking cool, but, <laughs> <laughs> but they lacked the functionality at that time. But uh, our expectations of like, are of the iPhone that we have right now. So, I think uh, the hope for the smart contract and the use is going to increase, and also the, there will be improvement in the design of the smart contract also. Right. Thank you. Mom. Any questions? Thank you. Okay. We're going to hold all the questions for the end because we'll have the round table and an opportunity to do that then. Um, Thanks for the outstanding presentation, Rosario and Amal. And that, that was a great way to set this up because it really did outline um, many of the really difficult challenges. 
So um, just to keep things moving along, um, so we've, we've heard from a, an application that's been developed and exchanged, very complicated smart contracts application. Now we're gonna hear from the CTO of Dragon Chain, uh, Paul Sonnier, who's gonna tell us about other smart contracts applications that are running on his platform. Hi, it's good to see you all today. Uh, my name is Paul Sony. I'm the CTO of Dragon Chain. So we are a company, you may or may not have heard of us. So we are working on our blockchain platform. Fundamentally, we're of the belief that blockchain is going to change the world and we're hoping we're gonna have a significant part in this. Um, our platform is a private blockchain platform that integrates with public blockchains quite nicely. So it's a hybrid blockchain platform. And we think this has a lot of benefits for the way things can work. And one of the strongest benefits is in relation to smart contracts. And so I'm gonna mention a little bit about that today. Um, I had some prepared remarks and I'm going completely off script. So let me know if I go completely insane here. Um, so one of the things about smart contracts, and we've been hearing a lot about this earlier, is that we refer to them as contracts, but they're really more like computer code. And it's code that you can look at, ideally, in the case of Ethereum, a smart contract is poked on Ethereum, is something you can look at. And the idea is that you should be able to understand it, vet it, agree that it's something that you want to enter into, that you know it won't change because it's immutable, and then you can enter into it. The problem is that that's not really the way the world works. Um, I know we have a bunch of lawyers in this room, and I'm willing to bet that none of them have actually read all of the terms and conditions for their iPhone updates. Um, it's very hard to actually read and review and understand all of the terms of contracts, particularly software contracts, particularly if you're not a software guy, or even if you are a software guy. And even well-written smart contracts can be vulnerable to bugs. Um, there's an old metric that says that any software over a certain length uh, has some critical bugs in it, and that length is incredibly small. Um, it's very, very hard to put contracts out there that don't have defects in them, and it's also very hard for people to understand the contracts that they're entering into. Um, we mentioned the DAO hack earlier. Another good example is the Parity multi-sig wallet problem. The Parity guys, super bright guys, they wrote the multi-sig wallet code, they put their own ether in there, and then, a rando on the internet found a bug, and boom, all their ether is kind of sitting there and it's inaccessible because a bug was in their code. So it demonstrates it's very hard to work with these things when you don't have what we would consider in the broader software world as a full life cycle involved. And a full life cycle of software, people don't generally think about this too much, but it involves not just the ideation and creation and deployment of software, but also the maintenance of software and eventual retirement of software. Um, again, willing to bet that nobody here is still running Microsoft DOS on their office machines. That has been retired and you've cycled your processes into something different. Um, in the case of fully immutable smart contracts that are executing on public blockchains, you don't really have an ability to revise those or to retire those. And it means that you have to put a very high level of stricture up front to try and make sure that everything is solid. And even then, if a bug gets through or if you find your business needs have changed at some point, and let's face it, business needs change, um, you're going to have to do something about that. So we're of the belief and I think it's a broad thing that we're approaching in the industry, that uh, some level of um, mixture of public smart contracts and private smart contracts is a sensible way to go. So you can say, here is the public component of the smart contract, that we can see that this is going to occur, but it may not encompass all aspects of all of the business logic that you want to have out there. Um, there's common cases for this one. So, uh, for example, um, I have a contract with my bank that's in the form of my home mortgage. Um, I don't want that to be fully public. I want that to be private. Um, on the other hand, my bank has a contract with the public wherein they're accounting for all of their mortgages. I do want their accounting for that to be public, but not to the level where they're displaying the value of my mortgage. So there's a, there's a varying level here. 
We believe that, and I think it's going to be true of pretty much everyone here that will eventually get to this, that one of the better ways to approach this is to deal with smart contracts that are uh, vettable, that are um, available, that you can say they've been uh, approved, notarized, uh, code reviewed, etc., but that there is a way to revise these contracts. And in the case of immutable smart contracts, like on blockchains like Ethereum, that's hard to do unless you're dealing with some external entity. Um, so we believe this is one of the ways that can be best approached with this. Um, at Dragon Chain, we're working to try and make this um, a firm reality where we can show this is a strong use case. Um, we'll get there. <laughs> There's effort to be put in. Um, so uh, that's about it. Um, don't want to go too long on this one. Uh, like I said, went far off the script here, but I uh, just thought it needed to be said. So thank you. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate that. I also want to mention that Paul is now serving as the co-chair of the Smart Contracts Alliance. So welcome to that role, Paul. Thank you. So our next presentation um, is from Olga Mack from Quantstamp, and she's the vice president of strategy there. And um, she's going to give us all the solutions to all these problems. So <laughs> Olga, we're counting on you. We're very excited to be part of, of the Smart, Co Smart Contracts Alliance. Uh, we see smart contracts as an alternative way to transact. Um, in the last 18 months or so, about $10 billion of dollars have been raised using smart contracts. $10 billion in this very young industry. That's a lot of money. Uh, we also see in the last 18 months or so the proliferation of this amazing technology. We went from 500,000 smart contracts to about 5 million in about a year and a half. That's an exponential growth of smart contracts. Uh, and we are very much in the beginning of this industry. We also know that smart contracts provide solutions to problems that we didn't know how to solve before. We also know they offer ability to create efficiencies for enterprises that are completely unprecedented. So the potential of this technology is huge. We have also talked about that the vulnerabilities are a problem. A few of you have mentioned the DAO hack. Anybody here has been affected by the DAO hack? One person. Um, but if you ever talk to somebody who witnessed their money disappear, see it in action real time, and not being able to do anything about, it doesn't matter how much of an amount they lost. The sense of being violated, the sense of feeling helpless is overwhelming. So. There have been other recent problems. I'll talk a little bit about batch overflow that happened in April of 2018. This one was not as impactful in terms of money, but it did affect confidence in the industry, and then it did affect the token price of some of the companies. So a few things. We've had these problems for a while. We're still having them. We will continue having them. Smart contracts hold a lot of value. That is one way of saying that they attract a lot of attention, they are a lucrative target, and criminals know about it. So a powerful technology that is also a big target. So at Quantum, we tend to talk about smart contracts in this way, is that blockchain is secure and smart contracts aren't. And the reason for that is because smart contracts are pieces of code written by humans. And humans make mistakes with a few exceptions. But by and large, most humans make a lot of mistakes. Uh, we also talked about smart contracts as if they're legal concepts. And they're not legal concepts. They're pieces of code that do three things. They store rules, they verify rules, and they execute rules. So most people compare them to very sophisticated vending machines. So vending machine stores a rule that if you put a dollar, you get a snack of choice. You put a dollar, it verifies that the dollar is accurate and actually meets the amount, and voila, a beautiful moment, you get your snack. That's kind of how smart contracts work. They're not really smart in the sense that this woman on the right, Emmy, is very smart. And they're not contracts in the sense of a bunch of legalese, put your name at the bottom and sign. 
They're pieces of code written by humans, and humans make mistakes. Um, we know that in the last couple of years, about 300 millions of dollars have been lost to hacks. We know that about 34,000 of smart contracts have vulnerabilities that, that can be exploited and can lead to financial losses. We also know that millions of dollars are at stake. So at Quantstamp, we tend to think of security not as a point in time problem. We tend to think of it as a holistic life cycle problem. So many companies worry about securities when they deploy smart contracts. As we discussed, smart contracts at this time, once you deploy, it's really hard to change them. It's impossible to change. So it's absolutely critical in a lifetime of a smart contract to make sure that it's perfect before you deploy it. And we do help with that. We have services that audit smart contracts. We have a protocol. We have various tools. We also, during the deployment, help uh, crypto companies to work with exchanges to certify that they're actually safe. And post-deployment, we have monitoring services to make sure that business people are empowered to keep their hand on the pulse of their important contracts and that their digital assets are safe. So we also generate reports in our, in our, in our services and in our uh, tools. Uh, that are very detailed and they are very actionable because we want to empower business professional to be in control of their smart contracts, to be in control of their digital assets. So we are very excited to work with enterprises of all kinds. We work with crypto native enterprises. We also work with very established enterprises. We're a YC graduate. We have secured more than half a billion of assets on, on smart contracts. We employ a um, number of PhDs, over almost a dozen of them. We use uh, enterprise grade techniques to secure smart contracts. Uh, and we're really excited to do this because we think that smart contracts contracts will not be proliferated until they're secure. Security is kind of like a plumbing in your house. It's somebody else's problem until it's missing. When you go and buy a house, you never buy it for the, for the plumbing. But you will never buy a house that has a plumbing problems. So security is a plumbing problem, and it's absolutely important one. Before we make UI very beautiful, before we we, we make a lot of applications. We have to make sure that the assets on the smart contracts are highly secure. Uh, we look forward to helping as many of you as possible. Please keep in touch. If you have any questions or would like to collaborate, definitely get in touch with me. I'm Olga at quantstep.com, and I would be happy to talk to you about security of smart contracts. Thank you. I feel so much better. I don't know about you all, but that's, that's great. <laughs> Thank you, Olga, for that. So. Um, now we're going to give a report on some of the recent activity of the Smart Contracts Alliance. And uh, as you heard from Perry Ann in the beginning, the Smart Contracts Alliance recently published a white paper, outstanding piece of work that Amy Kim, the Chief Policy Officer for the Chamber, led. So I'm going to turn to Amy. Are smart contracts valid and enforceable under existing law? We've heard a number of people, experts in this field, um, raise that question um, within their remarks. Um, that's a question that we set out uh, over a year ago to answer. Um, in our report, um, smart contracts is the law ready. And there's copies of it, um, maybe some around. I think there was some at the front. Um, the answer to that question is yes. Um, so how did we get there? Um, and what does it mean to be valid and enforceable under law? Um, at the issue, I think the questions arise because of the terminology itself smart contracts. Mark, you mentioned this at the beginning. Others have mentioned it as well. When you say smart and contracts, it, it makes you think, and especially lawyers or anyone, I think anyone hearing that would think, well, that's a contract. Uh, but it doesn't have to be. Um, they, you know, they, can be, they can be legal contracts. The code can create a legal, legally enforceable, valid, binding contract, but it doesn't have to. Um, as Olga mentioned, it's, it, can, it can just be code. And the way we've defined it is they are computer code that upon the occurrence of a specified condition or conditions is capable of running automatically according to pre-specified functions. So that can, it's an automatic reaction based on the, the coding that has been done. Um, so what that means is it can be the whole contract, 
but it doesn't have to be. It can automate a portion of the contract. Uh, some people think of it as automating the payment function, but it can automate other things um, as well. Um, so I'm going to dive a little bit um, deeper into that um, as far as why do we think that they're valid and enforceable. Um, there's two laws that underpin that. Um, the first is the Uniform Electronic Transactions Act. Uh, that was a model law developed by the Uniform Law Commission almost 20 years ago um, for um, the states to implement so that there would be a model framework um, across the nation to help unify um, uh, the laws that businesses would have to comply with. Um, that, that law was enacted in 47 states, um, and then three, the three main, remaining states implemented in their own way, but so we basically have this covered um, across the nation. Um, after that, at the federal level, just to make it absolutely clear, um, the, the federal government enacted the eSign Act to make clear that uh, what's been going on in the states is also supported at the federal level. Um, Two of our experts at this roundtable here, Margot Tank um, and Hal, are going to talk about this um, in a little bit more depth after me, but um, appreciate all the work that you guys have done over the past I mean, 20 years, really, of making it DocuSign and, um, and Margot, your work um, to really make this a reality. Um, but the fundamental issue here, why I raise it, is that existing law already considered um, the development of new digital electronic technologies um, that will operate in society. And these determine that the medium that you use, whatever electronic medium that might be, uh, should not impact the agreements between the parties and the way that they uh, come to agreement, uh, offer acceptance consideration. Um, the technology that's used doesn't impact that. Um, the, this, the reason this became an issue uh, for our Smart Contracts Alliance is that um, over the past year or so, um, a number of state legislators who are very supportive of the industry and um, wanted to be enterprising and um, it, it, uh, enacted some legislation to try to make that clear, to amend some of these laws to say specifically that blockchain and smart contracts are valid and enforceable. Um, well, that might seem to be a great thing, uh, what, what ended up happening was they, were, they didn't use the same language all the time, which we're starting to see that patchwork of legislation again when these uniform laws were designed to avoid just that. Um, so our work uh, at the chamber involved reaching out to all of those state legislators one by one and talking to them, explaining to them the research that we had done, the conclusions that we had made, um, and we were successful in five of those states. The, the law in the case of California uh, was entirely amended to look for a study into blockchain uses. Um, other states, they either let it expire or were withdrawn. Um, but so to date, there are four states that have enacted legislation like this and their definitions vary. And as we know, how people define this technology and the terminology we use matters. Um, so within that context, um, just a few weeks ago, Congressman Schweikert, who's also a member of the Congressional Blockchain Caucus, introduced legislation um, to try to forestall that effort um, to make clear and to amend the eSign Act to say, to recognize that um, technology using a blockchain and smart contract are valid and enforceable. Um, that was introduced the last day of the, the session, so we'll see how that develops. Um, but you know, your support has been critical to this effort and to our ability to work with the states and the federal government um, to make sure that these issues are understood, that people understand what smart contracts are, and that's what we're all doing here um, today, to hear about how they're actually in use. Um, the last thing I'd just like to say before I turn it over to Hal is that um, you know, this, this information, this report, the work that we've done, um, was not, would not be possible with some of our dedicated and tireless um, members. Um, as I mentioned, um, Margot Tank, um, her colleague David Whitaker at DLA Piper, and Patricia Fry um, did a significant amount of the research. Patricia uh, Pat was the, um, is a professor of law at the University of Missouri and was the um, chair of the working group at the Uniform Law Commission back when it first created that law. So having that kind of institutional, practical experience was, um, was incredible. Um, I'd also just like to mention that um, Miran Aparicio Bihuesca wrote a chapter in our report, which I'm, I haven't talked about here, but did a comparison under traditional concepts of contract law, which is at a state level, unfortunately. Um, but she um, did a comparison of 
common law principles, which is what the U.S. uses, and civil law principles, such as in Spain and other um, countries, um, you know, comparison of um, smart contracts and blockchain under those laws. And then finally, um, uh, Jenny, Jenny Chiplack, who authored a section on UCC Article 9 principles and how to secure um, your assets um, and, and thinking about principles of how to characterize assets using blockchain. So with that, I look forward to the conversation and thanks everyone for coming. So Hal, Hal Marcus, thank you for joining us from DocuSign, Global Legal Evangelist, and he's gonna just add a few comments about the- Thanks, Paul, glad to be here. Uh, I am daunted uh, by some of the expertise in the room and humbled by it. I am not a mathematician, Congressman, uh, and my son would attest to that any time I've tried to help him with his physics homework. Uh, we've had a lot of uh, perspectives today. We've had a lot of great information come in, um, and uh, I'm trying to think of what I can bring with these comments after all that I've heard that'll be the most valuable. And probably it is just really the perspective from DocuSign, a company I've recently joined, about how we see all of this. And I'm looking at it through the prism of my background. I'm a lawyer by training and initially by practice. Most of my uh, experience over the last couple of decades though is in product marketing around technology, primarily for the legal industry. That has made me very much a pragmatist. Uh, I believe in terms of how technology gets adopted and what are the facets of it. So we heard a lot from Amal about uh, all the challenges, all the, all the problems associated with this that we have to overcome. Uh, we heard sort of the solutions to some of those uh, from Olga. Uh, we've heard the promise of, of all of it, I think, uh, from Paul. We've, um, and we've heard from, um, from Amy now about the legality of all of this. Where I think we look at this, uh, coming from DocuSign, is really from the perspective of how this fits into something we've looked at for a long time. The company, long predating my arrival at the company, has been very interested in what they have called intelligent agreements. And that sounds a lot like smart contracts, and it's a very different thing. And they're the, the challenge of the, of the nomenclature, as you raised earlier. Um, by intelligent agreements, we're looking at ways of imbuing intelligence into agreements. And there are a number of ways of doing that. One example of that is creating workflow around an agreement, putting a template in place which routes it to appropriate signers, routes it for action and for activity in particular sequences. And this has actually been very successful um, for the company. So the advent of smart contracts and blockchain in general brings new capabilities to this long-standing focus. Uh, we see uh, great efficiencies potentially coming from on-chain smart contracts, both in terms of how contracts are executed, but also in terms of how they're formed, because it can open up new vistas and new kinds of agreements. So we're excited about the potential for the volume of business, the efficacy of business. We agree with the Chamber and applaud the work that they've done on this document, which I encourage you, if you have any interest in the legality of the space, to pick up a copy of today. Uh, kudos to Margo and to Amy and to others that have worked on this. And we agree that smart contracts are legally valid and really addressed to a large degree under UIDA and under eSign. There is specific uh, addressing of electronic agents and automated transactions. These laws were developed in a way to create uniformity and their strengths are also based on their technology neutrality and the fact that they don't rewrite pre-existing laws regarding contracts and assent, et cetera, and they work in a flexible manner to address all of those. So with those caveats in mind, while we very much uh, respect and, and, look, and appreciate uh, the legislative underscoring of the validity of smart contracts and any efforts to call attention to them and to forward the adoption of the technology, we believe legislation should also proceed very cautiously with an eye toward maintaining those principles that have been so successful in the area of electronic signatures to date. Uh, to minimize risk to foster adoption, much like the way we have addressed e-signatures to date, we believe workflow really is going to be key. And we heard a great deal about these issues today. Assuring assent to the terms of a smart contract is still critical. And this is an area that, as DocuSign, we're keenly interested in. 
reliably translating natural language terms into smart contracts and ensuring that people have the intent to be bound by the smart contract language just as they're being bound by the natural language is going to be of keen interest. This speaks to what Olga talked about in terms of whether smart contracts actually perform the way that they are meant to, but it also speaks to understanding what people are agreeing to. And you know, some of us actually do read our, our license agreements. Uh, not every word of Apple, that one's too long, but, and they haven't messed up with me too much yet. Uh, so, but we do read these things carefully and we do need to, a way to ensure that these things are aligned. Now, that also speaks to a future though where smart contract language is embedded into natural language agreements or replaces them altogether. And the nature of assent around those terms, again, is of keen interest to us. To the degree that standards start emerging in this space, uh, we're keen to see that happen. We're also very interested to see how different standards might work with each other. Work being done by IEEE, um, by ISO, relates to this area, and we're keen to see how other standards that emerge will work with those kinds of standards. Ensuring effective execution with surrounding security, the use of trusted oracles, all of these things are going to be critical to the workflow that is ultimately uh, going to decide, I think, the adoption of smart contracts. The way we view this is, again, all I can really bring is our perspective on this, is that this is very well aligned with our longstanding focus around intelligent agreements. This is, in a way, the next generation of intelligent agreements. And it's also why we have expanded beyond our e-signature focus to create what we call a system of agreement platform that is intended to let you do a great deal more than just uh, achieve a, a proper signature, but to prepare, uh, to manage, to act on, and to sign those agreements. So we're very happy to be working with the chamber, we're very happy to be here today, and we're happy to work with all of you as we move toward that future. Looking forward to the rest of the conversation. Thanks very much for your time.